jurisdiction, but the proper application of this court's decision in U.S. v. Medar mandates that the suspension of the six-year statute of limitations that Judge Lake had approved in 2016 was only for a six-month period of time. Therefore, it's our position that Judge Hughes had abused his discretion in denying the motions to dismiss that Appellant Pursley had submitted that were really not litigated and that, at a minimum, some of the counts should be dismissed and or a remand for further factual development. The motion to dismiss denial is a lot harder to prevail on than the denial of the jury instruction, isn't it? Yes, yes. I would think any district judge on a fact-specific issue of when's the final act would just say, let's hear, let's wait for trial. Do you have a case where, without filing a motion to strike and a bill of particulars, any circuit court has resisted, has reversed a denial of a motion to dismiss? Yes, I believe Judge Davis was on the panel in Wilson that reversed, this court reversed and remanded for an additional hearing after they did not, the trial court had denied the motion to dismiss. After a trial, there was an appeal. This court affirmed the denial of the motion to dismiss, but then said, because of a factual dispute concerning whether the letter on the motion. That's more of a sufficiency issue, isn't it? Well, no, it wasn't sufficiency of the evidence. It was a factual issue as to whether, in fact, the Bahamian government had actually received the letter that the government said they had sent, but there was an issue of proof there. That had only been raised not in the original motion to dismiss, but in a renewal or a motion to reconsider. After the trial evidence proffer. It was after, well, Judge Hintner did not hold a hearing on that. He denied that. This court remanded it to Judge Hintner. Judge Hintner then had an evidentiary hearing. I'm just interrupting because of your time, but we can give more time. Why aren't you pressing more the jury instruction? Or, of course, you want both. Well, I think they go hand in hand, Your Honor. And, yes, I think the jury instructions are so fundamentally flawed that there has to be a new trial granted on all four counts. But at the same time, I don't want to waive the opportunity to have this court address the motion to dismiss in the first instance because if this court were to affirm the denial of the motion to dismiss, it would be a law of the case, and I could not relitigate that before Judge Hughes on a remand if there was a retrial based on the— Counsel, while we're on the motion to dismiss, as I understand it, there was no evidentiary hearing on that motion? There was nothing. Did you ask for one? The motion to dismiss did not specifically ask for an evidentiary hearing, nor did the May 2019 second motion to dismiss that raised the statute of limitations issue. Okay. And was there an attempt to obtain discovery? As I understand it, there's some documents that the government has pertinent to the exchange between the Isle of Man and so on, but we've only seen in the record a few of those documents. Was there an attempt on your part, I should say on the defendant's part, to subpoena those records or try to obtain them elsewhere? No, no, the record does not reflect that, and obviously I was not either. Mr. Persley had two sets of attorneys, and I was not involved in that. I didn't get involved until shortly before sentencing. But, yes, there appear to be eight letters of transmission from the Isle of Man to our government. One and only one, the 5-18-17 letter, is in the record. The other letters are alluded to in an August 17, 2017 letter from DOJ, one attorney to another attorney, referencing the other Isle of Man letters. I suppose you could always move for a bill of particulars and say, what are the acts per count? What is the final act? But that wasn't done. That was not done, Your Honor. Then we get to trial, and you've just got a lot of evidence as to all four counts. They all have a six-year statute of limitation. Correct. Okay, so then you renew the motion. You request a jury instruction. Correct, Your Honor. The government's position previously at the jury charge conference was no, 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 for a variety of reasons. But on appeal, they're primarily saying that it wasn't lawful. The way you phrased it wasn't correct legally. Well, trial counsel, that's a problem because Judge Hughes never addressed the length of the suspension. When he came out in November of 2018 at the first pretrial hearing after Persley had filed his original motion to dismiss on statute of limitations, the government had responded in the sealed document. Yes, we know that. Okay. Judge Hughes just, because of what Judge Lake did, I'm not going to address this. So there was no actual 
litigation concerning the length. But in that rather chaotic jury charge conference, he eventually says, you know, I'll do it. I think it's two years and nine months. Yes, based on what the government says to him. That's correct, Your Honor. Uh, so at that point, should you have said, okay, we'd like to now modify our proposed jury instruction because now we know the amount of time total? Well, counsel certainly suggested that. In fact, Mr. Beatty, who was counsel for the government, admitted and conceded the court could give an instruction, admitted that as to count one, there were acts prior to the statute of limitations, and as I think we've demonstrated, counts two, three, and four also contain dates preceding the government's suggested statute of limitation as extended back to February 10 of 2010 or February 18 of 2010. So it is our position, Your Honor, that yes, a new trial on all counts should be granted because the jury was not instructed that in order to convict, it must find as to count one, an overt act committed within the limitations period as U.S. versus man requires. Uh, and as to the three substantive tax evasion counts, the jury was not instructed that before they could convict, they had to find that an affirmative act of evasion. Two quick question. Yes, sir. Your you Honor. didn't ever ask your client for a jury unanimity request, correct? And either that's because you looked at the law and it's not clear there has to be unanimity in an affirmative defense context. Go ahead and answer that. I'm not convinced that uh, he did that, that counsel, one of their instructions on, on the uh, it's referenced in the statement of the case in the brief. There are three or four other requested instructions that touch upon and relate to the statute of limitations request. But uh, no, I can't represent. What the case law say? Is it like a manner and means they don't have to be unanimous? Or no, I think they do have to be unanimous. What's the best case for that? Uh, I, I think Irby on, on uh, Irby and Mann, certainly the charge in Mann required the jury to find unanimously that uh, at least one overt act is to conspiracy. And I believe, I'm sorry, Your Honor. No, that's all right. It's a complex point. It is. Because for manner and means, overt acts, you don't have to have unanimity. But for an affirmative defense, statute of limitations, you do? I believe so. Uh, yes. I, I, Wilson, I'm not, I'm not sure it's Wilson, but Massimino and Smith's Supreme Court opinions indicate that. And I, I'm drawing a blank on the case in the brief that, that supports that. Your argument, your, your reversible argument is special to any unanimity issue because you didn't get the instruction at all. That's correct, Your Honor. And, and because of that, that's why the de novo standard applies because the jury instructions, given the affirmative defense that was raised and pre preserved, i.e. statute of limitations, that becomes an element of defense that the element of the offense that the government bears the burden of proving. Once it's raised and what if implicit in the district court's denial of that instruction request was its finding that tolling went all the way up to indictment because the Isle of Man response in May was only as to one request, but that Judge Lake had explicitly told based on multiple requests? Well, Your Honor, that there's a, a, an issue there. Okay, and I think that's a factual issue because yeah. if you look at the letter that they, the Isle of Man, the only letter in here, the 5, 18, 17 letter, it makes reference to the supplemental request. But they're responding to the initial request because they are responding with Royal Bank of Scotland records. So it's, although it's phrased as to the second or the, uh, I guess that's March 15th March or 16th. One, not the February one. Not the February one, but the documentation attached shows that it's responding to the original by virtue. We wouldn't of decide that in the first instance. No, no, but that's why I, I suggested, and I, I'm really convinced in light of Wilson, that there should be a remand because it's just not clear. It's just not totally clear. And I think, well, I'm done with it. Um, uh, counsel, let me ask you uh, not to, not to, interject into the discussion we're no, having no, no, about, the, about the, the interruption. And the, are, are you waiving any argument that the October 17th, 2013 Overt Act alleged in count one was not in furtherance of the conspiracy? Because it doesn't seem like it's briefed very much. I, I, I'm not waiving it, Your Honor, but uh, with regard to that particular point, because of the jury charge issues and the remand on anything, and the space limitations, and as the court could see, I had to adopt and 
because it's a very complicated case. The record was huge. But let me know I'm not waving it now. But but the key is obviously when the last act occurred. So for instance, like in count two, um, it seems like you're arguing that the last affirmative act. Well, well, the indictment charges the last affirmative act was on August 7th of 2010. I, I should say that you you argue that, but doesn't the indictment allege on count two all the way through 2017? Your Honor, and, and that's a, a faux pas by me. I did not, if you look at the indictment, the next page is one line at the top, and it talks about, I believe, the uh, four seven corporate tax returns all the way to 17. Right, right. So I, that was an error on my behalf that I own. Okay. Honor. My fault. Well, let but, me, but I, my position is that that is not an affirmative act of evasion. It's just not. Those seven, whatever the entities was, do not relate to the 2009 tax return. Right. Okay. And for count three, uh, same question, a similar question, I should say. The last affirmative act alleged was on October 12th, 2011, but the indictment alleges acts through at least the end of 2012. Is that not correct? Your Honor, I'd have to double check that because of my, my confusion with count, but I have the last affirmative act as to count three uh, would have been uh, October 12, 2011, the actual filing of the return. Right, that's the argument, but uh, my, I guess my question is the indictment, though, alleges acts through the end of 2012. In, in the affirmative act portion or the other portion of the indictment? It's my position that when the government says affirmative acts and they list one or two with or without dates, those are the affirmative acts that the jury must unanimously find one of in order to convict normally and with respect to a statute of limitations defense here that one of those was within the statute of limitations. Let me also ask you, with regard to the, these dates, if the instruction had been given uh, wouldn't the jury verdict form have had, would have, it would have been required that the jury would answer an interrogatory, when do you find the last affirmative act to have occurred as to count one? Is, isn't that correct? And then they make a factual finding over and above guilt or not guilty. That would be what I as a defense attorney would ask. I asked for that in U.S. versus Man, an opinion that Judge Davis was, was on the mm -hmm. panel. But there, Judge Sparks gave a conspiracy count, which had four or five objectives with, with different statute dates. He just gave an instruction saying, in order to evict count one, you must find a unanim unanimously find at least one overt act committed by such date, such date, such date, or such date as to eat any one of the five okay. objectives. Okay. But certainly a, 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 an interrogatory would be more appropriate, and that's what I had requested in man, but this court said Judge Sparks' instruction was adequate to right. protect my client. Okay. You cited Ninth Circuit pattern, so I take it that means our pattern instructions don't really address this. That's a bit of an oversight, isn't it? Well, Your Honor, I'm not critical because I don't think statute of limitations, yes, you're correct, Your Honor, but statute of limitations doesn't come up that often. Yeah. I, well, at least in my practice, it's come up more than maybe other people. But yes, the, the Fuchs case in Ninth Circuit make it clear. You look at what uh, a district court did in uh, Segalis, the, the case that this court uh, reviewed, where she gave an instruction. Give the instruction, get a special verdict, by count, 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 count. That's the easiest thing to do and the way to ensure jury unanimity. And without. Now, the, we're lucky here because all four counts are six years, right? Correct. You don't even have different pre-accusations. It would have been less, less confusing. Of course, Judge, did, did you Jews was going to Did sorry. you ask the court to give an interrogatory like that? Kersley's counsel did not, Your Honor. And, and, and I'm critical of them. They asked just for the, the instruction, and during the charge conference, you know, they, they refined that because the requested instruction, which had been filed way back, uh, did not include the suspension under 3292 for whatever length it would have properly been under Medar. And of course, I say under Medar, it was limited to six months because the Isle of Man's letter. Why would, he, why would he request a special verdict if he's not getting the instruction? Well, it, good point, yes. And of course, that was the he wasn't going to get the instruction at, he learned that at the charge conference right before the charge was, was given by the judge, but the judge admitted he'd look at count one and see if there were acts outside which the government had conceded 
there were acts outside, and then he came back and didn't do anything, and I believe my time. Time for a button. Counsel. Mr. Knapp. Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the court. Greg Knapp for the government. In Medor, this court set down a bright line rule for determining a- It's a hard rule. I admit it's a rule, but it's a tricky one to apply. Well, the bright line rule that the majority stated was a dispositive response to every item requested by the U.S. government. And our argument here is that it's plain that prior to the return of the indictment, the Isle of Man had not provided a dispositive up or down response to each of the items that the U.S. government had requested. And specifically, still outstanding were the government's requests for several witness interviews as well as a certificate of authenticity. Now, the defense trying to resist that conclusion points to the May 2017 letter from an Isle of Man rep that was mentioned earlier. Before we jump to the difficult calculations, one under 3992, I take it it's got to be the trial judge that does the calculation? Or is it a mixed question of law and fact? Well, it might be a mixed question of law and fact, but in any case, it is the trial judge. And that also follows from Wilson as well. That issue was decided in Wilson, the case- But Judge Hughes really never explained, count by count, what his Mayador calculation was. There wasn't any discussion. There wasn't any explanation. So to start, for me, this is what we know solidly, right? The indictment date is September 2018, right? All four counts, you count back six years. Tolling, we know, begins when Judge Lake entered tolling, right? Correct. And then the argument is over whether the March request reached finality in May, correct? That is the argument, yes. Counsel, you agree that the government has the burden of showing that the charges were timely brought and that there was a suspension? Well, I'm not sure I do. I mean, it's an affirmative defense of statute of limitations. And so the government's response in tolling was in response to a motion to dismiss as untimely. Now, of course, in the pursuit of that litigation, the government- But if they have evidence- Have the evidence. They have, exactly, exactly. I mean- Which they do, right? Then the jury's got to be instructed on it, I think. And as I saw the trial position, it was no, 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 no. But then on appeal, I see you were shifting primarily to, well, maybe, yes, that's the law, but they didn't request it correctly. Am I right in that shift? That's correct. I'm a little concerned. I think we might be blending two issues. One is the district court's calculation of is there tolling? What is the limitations period? And then separately, was the defense entitled to a jury instruction on that limitations question? I mean, Your Honor is correct. Our position with respect to the second question is that no, because the request for jury instruction set forth the wrong limitations period. I mean, this court's black letter law sets forth that in order to be reversible error from the denial of request for instruction, the request for instruction has to be substantially correct. And here we argue that- I think the difficulty is to say to them that they didn't get it correctly when they just said a pretty standard affirmative defense. There was pre-accusation delay here. We want the jury to find by count whether there was a qualifying act. And then I'm assuming it wasn't you, but when you read the charge conference, it is virtually never they've described the law wrong. It's no, Your Honor, it's not appropriate. That's not a good reason. Correct me if I'm- Yeah, it's too late. That's clearly wrong. Then it was this will invite jury nullification. Correct me if I'm wrong. These are all incorrect legal answers by the government. Are any of those correct? Well, the statement as to it's wrong, it has to be viewed in the context of- Okay, when the government said this is too complex, don't give it to them. That's wrong. I appreciate the point. Okay, when the government says don't give them the affirmative defense instruction that you're entitled to because that invites jury nullification. That's wrong, right? You see the problem? What happened below, as I read it, is Judge Hughes was told by the government emphatically, repeatedly, don't give any instruction. 
The better answer now is, well, what's the right one? Exactly. But he asked for the plain vanilla. The jury's got to decide if it's too late, pre-accusation delay. It's not, they're opposing a, a tolling. How could they have come up with the time period when they had opposed it and the judge had never said what he would say it is? Well, the judge accepted the government's arguments. I mean, the government denied the motion to dismiss, and in doing so, accepted what the government had set forth. Okay, not, so not, explicitly, the, not explicitly, not explicitly. Then you hear the trial evidence. Now you know everything you need to know, every final act by count. And it was, it was the burden of the government to prove, was it not, that, that uh, the charge was brought uh, within the prescription period? Correct. And the government has to... So why did it incumbent on you to make sure the judge charged the jury so that you'd have, a, you'd, you'd have that established? Uh, I disagree with that, Your Honor, because as I mentioned earlier, the statute of limitations is an affirmative defense, and so to request... Yeah, but it was raised. It was raised by the defendant. Doesn't that shift the burden? Uh, it was raised generally as limitations defense, but the question under review is whether or not it was then reversible error not to give the instruction that was actually requested by the defense. Because it's... Right, and, but he just requested give them the statute of limitations instruction, right? Well, that, that's that's, that's not... Years, if the government's response is, well, you got to tell us the exact amount of the suspension period, then the government's got to say what the time period would be. It can't be, but we're still opposing any instruction, right? Or where am I wrong in that? Well, it did set forth the time period. By count? I, I think the time period is the same for all the counts based on the, the application of Section 3292. It was observed first by the court itself that the limitations instruction that was proposed did not account for tolling. So That's, if you were back there now, what would the, the instruction have been? I'm sure you can do it if it's that easy. What should the jury have been told? It would have been appropriate to instruct the jury that they needed to find at least one overt act for conspiracy, one affirmative act for tax evasion, on or after February 18th, 2010, which was the limitation state that was accepted, at least implicitly, by the district court based on the pleadings that were presented in litigating the statute of limitations. Could the district court have done that if it had the time and the bandwidth to fix the erroneous instruction that was proposed? Yes, it could have done that. Well, as I read what the government said at the charge conference, where it said, well, yeah, you could charge that, uh, that, uh, uh, the jury, that the jury must find that, uh, that the charge was brought uh, uh, within, the, within the correct prescriptive period, within the statute of limitations, and without, without giving a, a, a time limit. Isn't that what was said at the charge conference? Uh, yes, I mean, essentially, it was recognized that that could be done. The problem is there was nothing before the district court to give it the language that was necessary. But isn't it the, isn't it the common practice for the district court at the charge conference, and I read the, the, the transcript here, and this seems like a fairly routine charge conference where charges, proposed charges are submitted, and very frequently, very frequently, they are written to be helpful to the side who submits them and the court can modify those as long as it's urged, and in this case it is urged because we've got a motion to dismiss even pre-trial, as long as it's urged, the district court can adopt or rewrite or revise with the assistance of the opposing party to get the law right, but has to give the charge. In other words, I don't think it's a good argument. Tell me, tell me if there's a case that says I'm incorrect. I don't think it's a good argument to say, well, what was submitted was inadequate or was legally deficient, and the court had its hands tied. It could either accept or reject, and, it, and it, as I understand your argument, you're saying it rejected an instruction that was submitted, that was proposed, that was legally inadequate. Correct. And I appreciate your point. The district court, of course, does have the discretion, often does, to rewrite deficient instructions to make them accord with the law, to make them balanced, I mean, again, the question here, I think, is does the failure to do that in this case, where we have what everyone agrees is a relatively complicated issue, I believe my colleague has just acknowledged that as well here today, was it reversible error for the district court not to take it upon itself and essentially save the defense from himself? 
And as for cases as to why that should not be reversible error, I would refer— But I think you have proposed from the podium, I think in response to Judge Higginson's question, a fairly easy way to present it to the jury. It's always easy, Your Honor, after the fact for appellate counsel to set forth what they might have proposed before the district court. But it's not after the fact. Right, that's right. It came up before, and it's at the jury charge conference, and jury charge conferences sometimes last for many hours. Good. I mean— And what you just said, I don't think is—with all due respect, I don't think it's rocket science. You said it, and many other people would fashion an instruction similar to what you've offered. It makes sense. I'm not saying it could not have been done. I'm not saying that. Yet we have cases where other deficient instructions have been proposed. The appellate court and the district court recognized they were deficient, and so no instruction was given. But those cases are usually where, in the charge conference, the government's saying, well, actually, that is an affirmative defense. And let's—here's what—they would do just what you did to us. Here's what we think it ought to be. That would have ripened the Meador calculation issue, because, of course, they weren't agreeing to your view. But instead, as I described, the prosecutor just over and over again said, don't give the instruction, and the court didn't. He didn't say, now we're going to work with the defense, and we're going to get it exactly right legally. I'm not sure the district court did that just because of what the government was saying. There was a lot of fluid conversation. Some points were accepted. For example, Judge Hughes recognized that there was a limitations period calculation. The judge said it would look at it, but then ultimately the judge just didn't give the instruction. And we say that is not materially different from, say, Lew, the Lew case cited in our brief, the Naranjo case cited in our brief, where this court recognized that there were deficiencies, there were opaque aspects of the defense instruction that was proposed, and for that reason, it was not reversible. Part of what's unique here is this, the 3992 MLAT world does contemplate ex parte contacts, right? And then they move to strike, and nothing's fleshed out because Judge Hughes says, whatever Judge Lake said, that's what I'll do. So they are handicapped. The government has a private dialogue with the judge. It is a little hard. I've never seen the Meador calculation world, but it's a little hard for a defense attorney if no one's willing to engage. Well, I'd say to the extent there are ex parte applications, that comes well in advance of the jury instructions. That was far over by the time we got to the instructions. I don't understand how that would hamper the exchange of proposed jury instructions. Well, I thought there were back and forth government contact. It was a pretty complex record of the government requests. Your whole argument depends on that, that this was not just a single Isle of Man finality moment. There were, nor was it a supplement request requiring a new 3992. It was still an ongoing one. Well, that's our argument with respect to whether or not there was error in not dismissing the counts as time barred. That's related but separate to the question of— You can't resolve the instructional point until you figure all that out. Correct. And so that's why we argue that the February 18, 2010 instruction that was argued by the government is correct because it's plain that the Isle of Man never made a final response to all the items requested by the government. And that is the rule— Did it make a final response as to what? Well, that's debatable. And I think the more important point is that when that was— It wasn't debatable. It was never made factual finding. We don't have a fact finding in front of us. I say debatable in terms of like what finality do you attach to that language. But I'd like to emphasize that the language of the May 2017 letter doesn't matter because when that letter came, the Isle of Man's response was not, in the words of Mader, facially complete. That is, unlike in Mader, the Isle of Man had not produced some evidence in response to the categories requested by the government. And so for that reason, on its face, the response is incomplete. There's nothing with respect to witness interviews. There's nothing with— That's a good fact argument, I don't think, and I'm speaking only for myself. We would decide that in the first instance. It might have been nice if Judge Hughes had entertained and made that determination, clarifying what the statute of limitations is. Let's assume he had to have given an instruction corresponding to an affirmative defense that was requested. I'm curious if you have any case law that says, would a special verdict have to follow and would a jury have to be unanimous, or is it more like a manner and means where you don't require unanimity? Do you have a case, a circuit case, any circuit, 
it confirms the answer to the unanimity question. I don't at my fingertips. What's your opinion? I want to make sure I understand the question. Are we talking about unanimity with respect to the acts generally or unanimity with respect to an act within the limitations period? I'm talking about not unanimity as to an overt act supporting a conspiracy because I think you don't need unanimity as to that. That's manner and means. But you do need unanimity as to elements. My question is affirmative defense. Do they have in a stat when a statute of limitations request is properly raised, supported by evidence, does the jury have to be unanimous as to at least one act being within the time period? Yes, I think that's right. Okay, I think you're right too. That wasn't here, but he didn't request it. Is that the answer to that? I'm sorry? That wasn't done here. Clearly, this jury was not. No, there was no limitations instruction. Therefore, there was no occasion to instruct them on the unanimity of the acts being within the limitations period. Did I understand? No, that's exactly the answer. So if it had to be retried, the government is agreeing what I thought, but I had been easily finding law on it, that not only did you get the statute of limitations instruction, but you would then also get the jury told they have to be unanimous to the one act within the period. I want to be careful that there was an act within the period. Our position would be they don't necessarily have to agree on the same act within the limitations period, but yes, that there was one act. So we're talking about multiple acts. One point I wanted to make earlier, as to this unanimity question, in case it's helpful, I did just check, and in fact, the jury was instructed that they need to find an overt, they need to unanimously agree on one of the overt acts of conspiracy for count one. Conspiracy. Yes, exactly. So I, but. That's what your position is. That is, we would not argue that's necessary, but that, that was, that charge was given. That's at page 4536 of the record. I just, since that was discussed earlier, I wanted to mention that. There was also a discussion earlier about some of the sufficiency of the acts that were, fall within what we contend to be the limitations period, within the limitations period, the last acts charged. I would just suggest that there's been no argument presented as to why those acts are insufficient. And so, any question on that issue should be waived for purposes of appeal. In any event, I mean, these acts consisted of, for example, the filing of false tax returns that maintained a false reporting position that was central to concealing the taxable nature of the income that was received in prior years. So, for example, count two, 2009 tax evasion. Mr. Pursley had received income, didn't report it in 2009, and also filed corporate returns that misclassified those receipts as paid in capital, as a loan to him that was not taxable income. And so, on the subsequent returns, four sevens in particular, one of his entities, the defendant maintained that classification for 2009, 2017. And although those are later year tax returns, it is in furtherance of the 2009 tax evasion because it maintains the lie. It maintains the false reporting mechanism that conceals the taxable nature of the income received in 2009. Again, I don't think that's something the court needs to address, but just in response to something that is— Here's something we probably have to address, however we decide this, especially if we were going to reverse. Are you arguing as to any of the counts that even if it were reversible error that the affirmative defense wasn't given, it's harmless because even accepting the May 18, 2017 point that they urge, nonetheless, one or more of the substantive counts under any accepted tolling— Correct. And I assume you're talking about hypothetical error from the jury instructions, not giving the jury instructions. Is that the question? Yeah. Assume error as to not giving the instruction on their theory of Neodor. Right. Are counts three or four, would they be harmless? They are still—counts three and four are still unquestionably good because all of the overt acts—excuse me, I should say the affirmative acts of tax evasion for counts three and four that were charged and proven occurred after the government's date, after February 18, 2010. Okay, but what if you accept their theory? Well, I mean, they dispute that, but it's hard for me to respond to that because in my view, there's been no 
explanation by the defense as to why there are additional counts, there are additional acts that they believe fell before the cutoff date of February 2010. Now, in the question related to count three and four may be appropriate on rebuttal is describe the proof as to counts three and four that showed an act that was predated even on their calculation. Correct. And I believe, just from reading the reply, the claim is that if you look at the indictments, the substantive counts make incorporation of prior paragraphs. And the defense is asking this court to assume that those prior dates, some of which were earlier, were part of the proof that must have been presented to the jury. But there's no support for that. And I'd also say that's just five more seconds. That's inconsistent with an argument that... Well, I'm just, for your future, you couldn't say five more seconds, you get out. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I appreciate that. Would the court like to hear my final thought? I appreciate the permission. I would just say that that argument in the reply brief is inconsistent with an argument that was made in the opening brief, pages 16 through 19, in which the defense insisted that these prior incorporated acts into the substantive counts cannot be considered for purposes of statute of limitations. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Firstly, this would not be harmless error. The sufficiency of the evidence, what the jury... Counsel, we took your mask. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize, Your Honor. Yes. The sufficiency of the evidence, we're not saying that the evidence was insufficient for the jury to have convicted. What we are saying is that these were elements of the offense as modified by the statute of limitations defense. That element had to be in there. Without that element being submitted to the jury, we don't know that the jury would have convicted... I'm getting mixed up. It's not an element, right? It's an affirmative defense. It's an affirmative defense that becomes an element of the offense that must be charged to the jury once the statute of limitations defense... But on counts three and four, isn't it true that if there were no act that created pre-accusation delay, accepting your Meador calculation, the failure to give the instruction would be harmless? You've got to look at the date as extended by Meador under 3292 before you can make that determination, and we don't have that... But I'm saying accept that you're right under 3992. Accept that you're right with your dating. Does it still... Oh, yes, Your Honor. ...counts three and four? Yes, Your Honor. Because with the absence of an instruction telling the jury to find an affirmative act as alleged in the indictment and as proven, okay, then you don't have a conviction based on every element of the offense. You certainly don't have jury unanimity. And remember that the failure to give the charge stripped defense counsel of arguing things to the jury. No defense... That's the whole purpose of Rule 30. You submit the instructions to the court. The court tells you what the instructions are going to be so you can tailor your argument to the jury based on that. I should have read that. In closing argument, he made no effort to say... He didn't talk about statute of limitations, obviously. He talked about intent and knowledge and the lack of it. And of course, for an overt act... Are you relying on counts three and four? I forget my train of thought. In counts three and four, does your argument depend on the cross-incorporation language? I don't believe so, but clearly there was lots of incorporation into those counts of dates way before. Go ahead with your rebuttal. Okay. I want to, with regard to the jury charge issue, I believe we cited it, but United States v. Megna. It's an old case, 1971 case, but it says very clearly, 50 years ago, the Circuit Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit laid down the rule that where the evidence presents a theory of defense and the court's attention is particularly directed to it, it is reversible error for the court to refuse to make any charge on such theory. That's this court's law. I'm assuming you cited it. You cited it, right? I did, Your Honor. But that's qualified, obviously, by if the request weren't legally correct. Your Honor, I could not find a case that modified that. I think that case law exists. You can't request an instruction incorrectly. Well, certainly, yes, there are limits, probably, but it's the duty of the court to instruct the jury on the elements of the offense, and because that's a defensive issue, that's what the court said. 
and I'm, I am very critical of the government in the charge conference, although they ultimately, you know, conceded, Judge, you could give this charge and you could do it this way. They resisted, 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 resisted. Uh, personally, did not receive a fair trial because of that. And, of course, the government in the brief does concede uh, that uh, the court should charge on count one as to an overt act. I believe that was the conceded that the district court could have properly instructed the jury to find at least one overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy and at least one of the tax evasion counts, uh, affirmative act of evasion. Now, if it does go back and there isn't finality in the Isle of Man, um, there's a lot of evidence facing your client that you're saying he'll be able to argue that it was pre-accusation of the letters. Your Honor, I believe that uh, if we get those other letters that the government chose not to put into their sealed submission in response to Pursley's motion, there are, as I say, four letters predating the 51817 letter. We don't know what they say. For that matter, we don't have a laundry list of everything that was requested in the two 1816 requests or the three 1516 requests, which is called a supplementary. And I want to go back to the point that just for emphasis, that the Isle of Man 5 1817 letter responded, although it's couched as responding to the the second or the supplementary. I'll let you go longer because I did stop him. You're very thank gracious. You. Again, thank you both for getting here. It's a really interesting case, a lot of interesting issues. Um, I think, Whitney, that means we're.